Hi everyone, uh, welcome uh, to our uh, uh, HOVL uh, Data Science Seminar Series, which is a joint program with ITPD Young Professional in Norway section. Today we have uh, uh, Dr. Hamid Reza Shakir. He is an associate professor from uh, Southern University of Denmark, SDU, and uh, he works in the Department of Center for Energy Informatics. And his research interest is uh, in access management, predictive maintenance, and uh, the similar topics. Uh, today, he is going to present one of his uh, researches, and it uh, might take uh, uh, 40 to 45 minutes. And after that, we have Q uh, Q and uh, answer sessions. So just please write your answers, uh, your question in the Q&A, or you can later, when he finished, you can ask your question. Okay, Hamid, the uh, stage is yours. Please. Thank you, uh, yeah. Mustafa, for your, uh, you know, introduction. Yes, yeah. as Mustafa said, my name is Hamid. I'm associate professor at Center for Energy Informatics, and uh, today I'm here to talk about, uh, you know, the digitalization and application in asset maintenance and management. Of course, our focus, as the, as the name of the center suggests, is on energy informatics. So we are interested in uh, basically using digitalization to uh, improve the energy efficiency and the reliability of energy infrastructure. Well, the way that actually I uh, organized the talk is that I start with a bit of motivation. And uh, after that, uh, I write, uh, I mean, I jump right into my uh, research results of several projects, actually. Uh, just to give you, you know, a flavor of uh, what we are working and, uh, you know, also that could uh, give, uh, you know, an introduction for possible collaboration for the future. Well, uh, yes, if uh, we look at the, okay, maybe here. Yes, if you look at uh, actually around us, we can see that digitalization trends are stunning. So look at the amount of data that actually is generated every day over the years. We can see that the number is exploding. So we have a lot of data generated. So we are collecting a lot of data. So look at, for example, internet traffic. If you compare it from 97, uh, 97 to you know uh, 2007 and now 2017, you see that I mean the amount is uh, increased significantly. So uh, generally, I mean the trend in glo uh, in connectivity is increasing. So more and more objects are connected. Look at traffic. I mean internet uh, development. Look at electricity network. In general, energy networks, district heating, they are all increasing. And both in developing country and also in developed uh, country. IoT is another thing that it actually uh, is, has a significant progress over the years. So we have more and more objects connected to each other. Our house is full of uh, devices and instruments that actually they are talking to each other. And this uh, shows that actually our cities and infrastructure becoming smart and smarter. So look at the network, you have to, you see a lot of sensors, they are talking to each other, they send information to you know each other and to a control room that you can actually visualize, observe and monitor lots of you know assets within the network. So, uh, of course, maintenance and asset management, which is a topic of today also, has seen progress. So, maintenance is evolving also. So, we had re reactive maintenance, we have preventive maintenance, which are actually evol evolving into predictive and prescriptive maintenance. So, uh, this does not mean that actually uh, we are not using reactive maintenance anymore. Uh, still, when we look at energy sector around us, I mean, we see that in a lot of, uh, you know, for example, DSOs, district heating companies, energy, you know, utility companies in general, they are using a lot of 
reactive and preventive maintenance. So, and what do I mean by reactive maintenance? It's if basically wait until it breaks maintenance. So it means that uh, wait until, you know, uh, something goes wrong and then you go and fix it. Preventive maintenance, of course, you send people, it's a scheduled maintenance. It's like, you know, I don't know if uh, in your elevator, you see that actually they have inspection, I mean, for, for you know, fixed interval. So um, you have a fixed interval that actually you go and check your system for faults. So that's preventive maintenance. Sometimes it's just simply unnecessary. And of course, that's expensive also. Predictive maintenance, basically you pre uh, predict faults before they happen. And uh, yeah, and of course, uh, we do maintenance at the right time in predictive maintenance. Prescriptive maintenance is a bit different. Not only predicts the fault, but also comes with uh, come up with a prescription, so solution. And this predictive and prescriptive uh, maintenance, they are the latest technology in uh, maintenance uh, field. Well, yes, we need a smarter asset maintenance and management, not only because you know maintenance has been evolved over the years and our systems are smarter because we have challenges. Our infrastructure are getting old. If you look at, just to give you an example, if you look at the distribution system and transformers in distribution system, particularly 60 to 10 kV transformers, we see that a lot of them, for example, in Denmark, they are old. They are, you know, 40% of them are more than 50 years old. So that's a lot. Okay, transform is not the only asset uh, that actually is uh, getting old and older. Uh, we have also underground cables, uh, 10 kV cables that uh, they are paper and oil insulated. And a lot of them are more than, you know, 30 years old. And when they uh, get more than 30 years old, uh, of course, you have to replace them. And that's what we do in Denmark. But um, also, if you don't, I mean, you can't replace all of them at once. It's quite expensive. So what we do is that uh, we prioritize which one to change and uh, based on budget at hand, of course, that's an asset management problem. Then we decide which one to uh, replace. But the fact is that when they uh, become this old, actually the number of falls, they goes up rapidly. So we have to have a careful and you know uh, precise schedule for renovation of such uh, cables. So uh, giving you another example of this kind, but in a European scale is basically low voltage power lines in Europe. So Denmark is not the only country that has this problem. If you look at the European lines, also you see that uh, 25 to 35% of the lines are more than 40 years old. But this is not the only uh, issue that we are facing in distribution system. Uh, we are also, you know, getting rid of our thermal power plants, no clear power plants. And uh, so, and we move toward integrating more and more renewables like, you know, PVs. And that means that actually they put, this puts a stress on our grid. Increased electrification in general actually put a stress on our grid and uh, increase the fault vulnerability. In Europe, you have to, I mean, we have to, um, invest around 375 billion uh, euros on our grid if you really want to uh, go green. Only on the energy sector, we have to invest this. And in Denmark, actually 6 billion euros, which is much larger than the current uh, investment level. So there are a lot of investment. Uh, I mean, a lot of investment is required and uh, we need to do uh, this investment in a smart way, such that we minimize the, you know, the cost and also maintain our security of supply in a grid. Another example that actually I use for motivation is the building sector. We know that building sector is responsible for around 40% of you know, energy consumption, also 40% of greenhouse gas emissions. So uh, 
of course you would like to change this and there are huge uh, i mean potentials here so uh, according to danish building research institute uh, we have uh, i mean it is possible to get energy savings around 70 75 percent by 2050 in denmark so alone this um, this is a, this is uh, a lot of you know opportunity for us and of course, uh, a big part of it comes from, you know, detecting inefficiencies and fault in buildings. If you look at uh, USA, we can see that uh, basically uh, faults are responsible for a large portion of, uh, you know, energy base and also cost uh, in uh, US. So this is some example, concrete example about duct leakage, for example, it's back leak left on when no one is here and things like this. So just to give you an idea about, you know, energy impact and also financial impact this might have. Okay, so you might say that, okay, that's quite old, 2005. Then I prepared one more recent for you. The situation is better, but not that much better. So still there are a lot of opportunity. A survey from 2017 also show the same trend. Okay, closer to home, uh, actually closer to my office, is our building here, uh, OU44. Basically, that's my neighbor building. And uh, here also we have false issues and false they cause you know inefficiency and waste. So uh, we have an, uh, uh, I can tell you about the story of a CA2 sensor that we had in our uh, you know, build teaching class, OU44 that was faulty. And since our ventilation runs, you know, uh, gets input from um, CO2 sensor. So we had a bit of issue. So we had unnecessary running ventilation and that uh, cost, you know, uh, 337 euros per week. So, uh, and this type of problem has to be avoided. So we need to, uh, there are a lot of opportunities here. And uh, yes, I think we have enough to conclude that uh, there are a lot of uh, opportunities for digitalization, and in particular uh, in addressing issues and faults. So that's why in this, uh, you know, uh, in this uh, era of digitalization, so we defined our mission as uh, to empower the smart digital transformation of the energy sector in Center for Energy Informatics. So in our center, actually, uh, we focus on different, you know, uh, application fields. And uh, also we are responsible for, you know, uh, two types of education, energy informatic education and energy system engineering, uh, I mean, education. But me, myself, I have actually, of course, I uh, collaborate with my colleagues here at the center, but we also have uh, our small, uh, uh, you know, research group. Uh, composed of PhD students and postdocs that uh, we all focus on digitally enabled asset maintenance and management. So of buildings, of infrastructure, energy infrastructure. So whatever has to do with asset maintenance and management, so is interesting to us. All right, back to the building example. How did we uh, actually figure out uh, the fault in a sensor, CO2 sensor? Uh, so that's actually a part of our research project called CORDC, which was uh, funded by Innovation Fund Denmark. So in that uh, project, we proposed actually a hierarchical uh, framework for fault detection and diagnosis in building that actually start from the whole building level goes down to system level, then subsystem level, then component to find fault and you know uh, issue. And in that uh, example that I just showed you, so we had our consumption detected, then we see that actually we could identify that it's in the HVAC system, not in lighting or you know other type of system. Then ventilation number three, we had four ventilation actually. Ventilation number three was responsible for the uh, issue, and then we, we went down to the faulty CO2 sensor. Yes, um, 
So our main contribution in the projects, this project and also uh, some other project was, uh, you know, data validation, designing online simulator for fall detection, you know, uh, proposing a framework to filter out, you know, alarms and, uh, you know, to be able to rank alarms based on the, and prioritize alarms. And I mean, FTD based fault detection based, uh, you know, uh, basically a framework that actually can uh, detect faults and diagnose it based on virtual sensors or soft sensors. Consens consensus based uh, methods for fault detection and machine learning based fault detection and prediction based on fault simulation, detection based on fault uh, simulation, and uh, the method, I mean, well-known residual generator method. So um, so that's our contribution that for So I try to actually select some of them and explain uh, a bit further the methods. So the first thing is data validation that I always recommend. Before doing any data-driven things, the first step uh, is data validation. The data has to be, you know, be able. You need to be able to rely upon your data before concluding anything uh, from your data. So we have this famous, you know, uh, thing that says "garbage in, garbage out." So better to make sure before the using your data for anything to, uh, that actually your data is of sufficient quality. So. How did we do it initially in a building area was to basically, you know, we developed a software that could do data validation for us. And basically what we do is that we design some tests like range tests, latency tests, spark tests, city tests that they could uh, potentially identify invalid data for you. For example, just to make it simple, you are, we are talking about humidity in a room. So humidity means that actually, uh, I mean, it has to be between zero to 100 percent. What if your reading is like 100 to any person? Definitely is wrong. It's invalid. So this type of simple test was quite valuable, actually. You need to do before using any data-driven approach or even model-based approach for calibration and for things. I mean, you need to be able to def uh, rely on your uh, data. So another uh, contribution was online designing online simulator with a filtering mechanism. So what do I mean? So I think you have seen the similar thing. So here we use basically a different type of model. Here you see an edge plus model, for example, in this photo. Uh, but um, I mean, the, what you do is that you simulate your model and then you compare it with the reading of a sensor or measurements in general. If there is a deviation, this means that you, you are, uh, there is some abnormal reading. And of course you raise a flag and you raise an alarm. So that's basically also called, uh, I mean, discrepancy detection method. That's uh, the, the method is called. So uh, of course, uh, that's what we did. So that's the general framework. What, what is new about this one is uh, actually a filtering mechanism. One of the things that we observed throughout the years, uh, I mean, we uh, dialogue with, you know, consumers of analytics, like energy advisor from Schneider Electric or, you know, other type of, uh, you know, data analytics was that the users usually, uh, they get a lot, a lot of alarms and warnings and after a while, they start just ignoring the whole thing. So turning off, you know, the whole thing or just ignoring. So uh, we really need to have a filtering mechanism such that, uh, I mean, uh, they, be, uh, they should be able to rank everything. Of course, in something like, uh, you know, in this uh, advisor, data analytic from Schneider Electric building advisor is called. Uh, they try to quantify it based on a cost. It's quite a static, it's quite rough estimate. So we wanted to have more, uh, I think, uh, more accurate uh, quantification of significant, significance of deviation from the, you know, normal deviation. And that's how we uh, do it in, uh, in churn of bound. Churn of bound, I mean, the, the whole theory comes from telecommunication and, um, 
basically it assigns probability of uh, which quantifies the significance of a deviation from a baseline. So we use it for the first time with the energy applications. We modify the bit we have to to fit the application. And then of course, you for any deviation, you have a number between zero and one. And then of course you class, uh, I mean, you can classify. For example, in our application to simplify things, we use traffic light, you know, colors and classification, three types of classification for each deviation. So now, I mean, you can actually uh, say which deviation is more significant and has to be, you know, alarmed. Okay. Um, and I'm going to use this churn of bound uh, also in other applications. It's not only buildings. So we have improved it and we used it in other applications. As well. You will see it in a while. But anyway, also well, I talked about virtual sensor, which is actually quite hot topic also. It has been around uh, you know, for a while, but uh, it is quite interesting that, uh, I mean, FTD based on uh, virtual sensor works like this. You have a reading from a sensor and also estimation of the value of that sensor from other readings. So you compare these two, and if you see a deviation, then there is a fault. If not, of course, it's a normal operation. So that, that's uh, the way that we do it. It's a good way to, to, I mean, you can use it for fault detection, but also in other applications, we have used it as a virtual sensor, really. Because they, for example, in district heating system, they want, uh, I mean, the district heating company wants to know, I mean, in control room, I mean, up, they have actually an idea about, you know, uh, about the heat that they actually uh, push into the customers. Down there, they have a smart heat meter, so they know, but in between, they have little things. So they need to know what it's uh, in between. So there also, we use a lot of virtual sensor uh, instead of, you know, deploying extra sensors, which are going to be costly. Anyway, another set of methods that we developed and we worked on was a consensus-based uh, con method for FTD in, uh, you know, VAV units. And uh, you know VAVs, I mean, these are the holes in your you know, ceiling in, uh, related to your ventilation. It will be open and then you will have ventilation. So depending on how much they are open, of course, uh, you ventilate more or less in a system. And these systems, of course, they are uh, quite identical. They have to be. And when you have a lot of uh, identical systems, uh, there is a chance to actually use this consensus uh, based method for FDD. The assumption behind this is that uh, majority of similar system, they behave in a similar way. So and if some system uh, are deviating from this common behavior, then they are abnormal systems. So that's a fault. So, and in this work, we did exactly the same. So we had like 12 VAV and two of them, they were, uh, I mean, behaving in different way. So you convert it to some episode database and then you aggregate them and then you measure the difference and the violation of the, you know, from the aggregated behavior. And then of course you can um, identify the problematic, you know, objects. Of course, there are mathematics behind this. You don't see so much mathematics or you don't see any mathematics here. There are papers out there and uh, the lecture is recording. So you can uh, easily search my name with the method and you find the papers to read. I know that you like mathematics also, but it's Friday afternoon. So any case, uh, we had also some uh, FTD methods, basically fault and critical event prediction approaches that uh, we have done on buildings uh, in collaboration with the uh, NASA sustainability base. And uh, so they have developed a tool using machine learning for prediction of fault and critical event. So what we did was that we had a bunch of researchers over there visiting them and uh, help them, I mean, with the tool and also with the, with the development of a tool and also with using this. And I used it actually for electrical system and also for buildings. Here are the results. Actually, we showed that, um, I mean, uh, 
it is possible to predict the fault before it, uh, it happens in uh, you know buildings at least uh, for the building OU44 that I showed you, which is actually our living lab. So we have a lot of sensors over there and we are monitoring the building quite well. So we compared our result with CVA, with KDA, and uh, our uh, result shows that uh, actually, yes, with a bit of you know extra false alarm rate and uh, missed detection rate, we can actually predict rather than detect. What? Let me move to another type of uh, energy system, which is district heating system. Digitalization in district heating system can actually has a lot of potential. Can improve uh, energy saving 10 to 20 percent. Can cut peak loads. Uh, I mean, uh, peak loads by 20 percent, and also can. Uh, save some costs related to maintenance. Of course, for digitalization, you need data and you need methods. And our work is mostly on a method development and analytic actually development on top of it, just to make sure that actually we can deliver those savings. Uh, a report out there, a survey out of, uh, you know, with participation of more than 10 um, district heating systems uh, company, Operators in Denmark actually shows that uh, the annual saving by remotely read measurements, being a smart meter, uh, I mean, would be like 678 Danish krona per heat meter. So that's, I mean, for for district heating company, small and also medium, that's a lot of money that you can save just by having a smart meter and using that not only for billing purpose, but also for some asset maintenance and management. So I have a project actually, uh, which is called PROMA, Proactive and Predictive Maintenance of District Heating System. In a project, actually, we focus on district heating maintenance and asset management for district heating system. Basically, we develop a software which has three features, data validation and reconstruction, always validate data first, and then they, uh, we use it for maintenance and asset management. Fault detection and diagnosis, and another con tool component, software component, fault and critical event prediction. So we use data from existing infrastructure. We are not deploying any extra sensor uh, on thermal grid. So a SCADA system and a smart meter uh, data we use here to improve the maintenance and asset management. Okay, so here data validation that you see is an improved version of the, the one that you saw actually uh, in the building area. So um, we call it contextual data validation. You remember in the building case, I told you that actually one of the tests was a range test, upper and lower bound of a variable or a reading you, you observe. Like, you know, humidity case, which has to be between zero and 100%. So of course you can improve it if you just look at the dynamics also, meaning that you have a sliding uh, window. That improves the, you know, it's better than a static, uh, you know, upper and lower control limits. Here you see that actually we have done it uh, with a sliding uh, window and no abnormal situation is detected. But if you turn it into contextual data validation, meaning that you see the value in a context. Here we see a forward flow in a district heating system, but of course we see it in a context of outdoor temperature. If we put it in this context, then you see that there are some violations. So these are this part is abnormal. So in other words, if we see, uh, I mean, we can see the value all, or we can see the value within a context. The val seeing a value within a context is more, uh, you know, uh, it's more accurate, gives you a more accurate or indication of a fault or abnormal situation. I mean, you're hitting this, uh, you know, just, just another example, your heating consumption depends on, a, on if it is a winter or a summer, you know? So, but if you just see the number, it can't be more, I mean, too accurate. 
Okay, the second word, uh, I mean, tool that we developed was fault detection and diagnosis for, um, for this rekeying network. So you have a bunch of variables, that's, uh, readings from the sensor, so that you get. So all of them you basically re uh, put in one matrix and reduce the dimension, and then you define a condition indicator for the network. Of course, now you can see this curve, Q statistics, and that shows you if and you have a bound. So when you are when you are deviating from this and going up, there is actually violation. And of course, you also filter it like before using churn of bound. And you can know with, I mean, here you, it is obvious that I mean, which one is more serious than the others to look into it. So, and there is all, always also a way to go back to the sensor responsible for the problem using contribution plots and things like this. Well, third component related to this ticketing system is a fault prediction in district heating system. So if you look at substation in district heating networks, uh, in a substation actually we have some uh, return pumps. And those return pumps are expensive and uh, you don't want them to be damaged. So the way that we do it uh, now is that we have, uh, in order to prevent uh, cavitation, what we do is we have a mechanism there that can uh, warn us, uh, I think 60 seconds or 67 seconds before that and turn off the, when there is a risk of cavitation, turn off the, disengage basically the pump. So that's, that's the way that actually they do it today. And why they do it? Because uh, they, want, they do not want actually the pump to be damaged. And what, if they do this way, of course, there is also a pressure surge that develops. And this press, uh, pressure surge uh, has kind of harmonic effect, which means that actually it can damage the nearby pumps. And of course, that, that one is also not uh, desirable. So the three heating company asked us to be, uh, to be able to, uh, I mean, ask us uh, if we can predict is risk earlier. And that's exactly what we did. We predicted the risk related to caviation, the cavitation, I mean, uh, earlier than the current state of the art technology using machine learning again. So the current solution is that uh, they predict, the prediction horizon is 66 second, and uh, the recall is 100%. So they capture all cavitation risks but alarm is only, you know, correct 72% of the time. That's the precision that we have. Our solution using machine learning here, actually it can uh, increase uh, the prediction horizon significantly. I mean, look at here, for example, you see it's close to one recall, you know, depending on, a, of course that depends on a prediction horizon. For five minutes, you have the best results but then 10 minutes, even for one year, uh, one uh, hour, 60 minutes, the results are not that bad. So of course then we predict for them and they try to control the, the pressure in another way using a, a smart controller. Then nothing is damaged, everything goes smooth and nice. So yes, I talked about maintenance a lot and I would like to close uh, by a bit of uh, asset management in particular for an innovation planning in the you know, underground cables. So if you look at the, this, um, these two figures here and here, this one is electric uh, you know, underground cable. The 10 kV cable that I told you that they are getting old and these red, uh, they are actually faults that happen, historic faults that happen in the grid. And uh, yes, so there are a lot of 10 kV, so we would like to know which one to replace first. Why? Because uh, replacing 
all of them are quite expensive and DSO does not have, uh, I mean, the necessary budget to do that. So we can only uh, replace them every year around, I mean, uh, I don't remember exactly the, but I think it's around 20 kilometers or so. So that's not much basically. So you need to prioritize, to have a list of, you know, uh, list of uh, cables, underground cable, 10 kV cables, based on uh, their fault vulnerability to know actually what to do. And here is actually the strict heating system pipes and thermographic faults that actually are observed. So the same thing we would like to do here to know where to focus our maintenance efforts. Um, yes. And that's actually how we do it. Uh, so we use, we have a uh, maintenance recording, maintenance data, and we have also data about the environment that uh, underground cable or pipe, this heating pipe is working with. So for example, the type of soil that is around your cable or your pipe, road type, land use, you know, so on and so forth. So different features we looked into. And then we found the correlation between different feature and the fault record. And we use it for predicting a basic fault vulnerability. And the outcome was actually basically uh, a list of cables or pipes based on their vulnerability to fault. This work has been improved actually significantly over the years. Uh, but anyway, that was the main uh, frame of the work. So let's, let's have a look. We have this fault capture, land capture, capture a standard way of evaluating our result here. So uh, this curve, the B, I mean, the, 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 you know, higher the curve, the better, basically. For electrical uh, distribution system, we didn't have actually the age of the cable to compare with. And that's an, uh, an issue, uh, I mean, here. Uh, we had a lot of uh, small DSOs that they actually merged and through this transformation, a lot of maintenance uh, records, they are gone. I mean, the age, information of assets. So, and it's quite common actually. And some of them are, they have to be recovered from some handwritten stuff and uh, so, that takes time. Anyway, so for electrical system, actually we compared it with a naive approach and we could see that actually we had some improvement. In my recent, uh, I mean, project, I think just a few days ago, we actually, uh, on a part of grid with the age, we compared it and actually we saw that actually it is improved also. Because one, one approach could be that uh, you, you change, renovate based on the nominal age. Is it a good indicator? Yes, it's better than, than naive approach, but it's not the best approach because the operational age is different than, uh, you know, nominal age. And of course, what you care about is the nominal age, which is more accurate. So let's have a look at district heating system. Uh, I mean, the same theory we applied on a district heating system and there we have the age. So, and you can see that it's a naive approach. This is age-based you know, fault, and this is our approach, which is up more than this. And uh, that shows that actually 60% uh, of the faults, they happen in 30% of the, the network, which is quite nice. And road type actually is quite, uh, quite effective. It's very important in a scoring. And also joint count, how many joints we have. That I think makes sense because issues they happen at the joint mostly, even for electrical system that we tried actually, we just got some result, new result. Shows that joints are quite important actually. We actually excluded uh, age and we compared it. So with, now we have the result with age and this is with age and this is without age. And we can see that even if we do not use age, still we, can, we have good, uh, you know, performance here in capturing uh, fault vulnerability. So yes, that was uh, some of the results that we obtained and I wanted to, to share with you guys, but uh, I also need to talk about some challenges 
that we are facing in a field, in particular when it comes to adaptation of the technology and development of the technology. And I'm talking about asset maintenance and management, why we are not using predictive asset maintenance and management or prescriptive asset maintenance and management. We have a lot of challenges to face. One is data quality and availability. You saw that actually we closed the three years project uh, and throughout the years, we didn't have age of, you know, uh, of our underground cable. So bad record of da uh, data, missing data, not, uh, I mean, data are in different standards. So how to basically integrate all of them, that's another issue. Because remember, we, you, you are using different data sources and combining them are quite challenging. Of course, if uh, the resolution is not enough and you, uh, I mean, the, you need extra data, you need to also pay for extra sensors and infrastructure, communication infrastructure in particular. And uh, we know that actually the, the, the companies, they gain out of it, but uh, they should uh, see it in a pro demonstration project. And, uh, and sometimes actually quantifying them in a short time, the benefit in short time, return on investment is quite actually difficult. So you need to actually observe something, let's say in 10 years, you know, and then show the, the benefit. Of course, regulation here can help, uh, but uh, yeah, carrot is better than a stick, usually. So uh, also I'm, uh, the change in a you know, culture of the company, that's a bit difficult generally. So uh, company has a, you know, they are a bit reluctant to try new things when everything is working, you know. But we know that if we do not react now, we will have problem in future. So, and that's an issue also. So these are the, basically some of the challenges that uh, we are facing, but also, I mean, educating people with expertise within energy sector is very important because we have also, you know, gap in expertise. So we are lacking people with data skills, with you know digitalization background in uh, companies, energy companies. We, we are much better than before, but still there is a room for advancement. Yes, so I would like to thank, uh, of course, my uh, funding agency, UDP, which has financed uh, the projects, these three projects that I talked about. Uh, I mean, I shared some of the results of these three projects with you. And uh, yes, thank you so much. I will be available for any question that you might have. Or thank you, you so much. Extra, uh, yeah, explanations. Yeah, thank you so much, Hamid. It was a very interesting uh, presentation and a lot of uh, useful information you shared, uh, you shared with us about all the projects you have done so far. I know that